I'll meet you in the lobby lockdown. I have Emily Hayden. She's a founder of the Talent Connective, career recruiter, networking enthusiast, and tea drinker. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm very, very well. I um, yeah, very much looking forward to having a chat today. Oh, good. How's lockdown treating you today? Is it? Are you are you ready for um, release soon? Are you? <laughs> Are you getting a bit, yeah. sick, a, bit, a bit sick and tired of it like I am? I actually, um, I think the introverts have the advantage on this one where a little part of me has actually really enjoyed the solitude of lockdown. But I was thinking today, I think it's the first week I've started to go, okay, now I'm finally ready. Yeah. <laughs> Time exactly. to open up the doors and get back outside. Exactly, the countdown's on. Now, Emily, can you give us a little bit about your background? We'd love to hear about where everything started for you. With the talent connected and your background? Yeah, so I, I've been a career recruiter now uh, almost for a decade and a half and ironically came into recruitment because I um, had always had the travel bug, um, came back, decided I would start my study career very late in life after doing a couple of years kind of trekking through Europe, um, met my now husband and at the time decided we'd go trekking through India, Africa and, uh, oh, sorry, India, Nepal and Thailand back then um, and needed, I, I had calculated I was going to put my degree on hold for five months, was the only period I needed to work just to pay my holiday in typical student mindset <laughs> and um, it took a temp job in recruitment and I have been there for almost 15 years. So. 15 years, wow, that's great. And just what, what city are you in? Where, whereabouts are you? I'm in Brisbane. Brisbane. Yeah, I thought so, Brisbane. So can you tell us more about what makes the Talent um, Connective different to other recruitment agencies and how you assist your clients um, through the journey of recruitment? Yay. Do you know, that I think there's, there's two differentiators on this one. Um, one is, you know, let's be honest, recruitment's got a, a, a terrible... Um, industry name it's almost like saying you know you get the same response when you say you work in banking or um, you know there are there's some fields that <laughs> are a little bit cringeworthy around the barbecue and I think a big part of that is um, that as an industry we've not evolved our sales process over a very long period of time so from a customer experience perspective um, you know candidates tend to feel typically um, you know, very often like a number or a commodity and clients will very often feel they're hounded, have you got any jobs, all that kind of thing. And a big part of that is that our operational metrics have not changed internally. So we don't measure, typically, we don't measure customer experience. We measure the things that drive people crazy, like number of calls made to organisations to ask for number of jobs listed, number of resumes sent out the door, whether they're accurate or not, all those types of things. So the biggest differentiator is that I don't measure any of those things in the business because they're terrible for the, the impact on, for the customer on both sides. Um, and I'm far more interested in um, the, the customer experience and, and what the, the journey of securing a role or a teammate looks like. Um, the other big differentiator is where our money goes on the other side. So, um, you know, we invoice our organisations like any other business the difference is 10% of our revenue goes directly to communities in India, Africa and Bangladesh to help with uh, becoming self-sufficient from aid um, and another 1% goes to Australian uh, bush conservation and protection. Oh, that's wonderful. That's really, yeah, really great. Um, now, with COVID-19, how's that impact? Well, it has impacted a lot of careers. What would you suggest... Um, to, for those facing re redundancy at the moment? Yeah, this, oh, look, this is such a tough one. And yes. particularly most of the recruitment that I do is in fields like, um, you know, marketing or, or those sorts of areas, which is an industry, you know, that is one of the first departments to get cut, like so many others. Yes. Um, and, you know, it, it's, an, it's an interesting one because we know that organisations that continue to market their services through a down period that do it well will come yeah. out on top. And so depending on, depending on the way you position your business, it makes a lot of sense not to make reductions. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Yeah. So, um, look, I, uh, there are a couple of things in terms of advice that I would say to people is there will still absolutely be opportunities out there. We don't have any less 
money in market or any less resource in market, what we have is a reshuffling uh, of where that resource is going. So give it a little bit of time, particularly now that we've been in lockdown for a little while, and you will start to see trends in the data around where people spend. And that will start to give us clues around in this kind of new normal, where are those opportunities emerging? And um, the other piece is don't be disheartened. It always takes longer than you think it's going to take mm -hmm. to find something. I would say probably add a little bit of extra time to that given the market, but don't stop doing what you do. You know, once you get past that initial hit of being made redundant, because it does really almost floor you to a degree because we're so intrinsically linked in our identities to the work that we do and the contributions we make, don't stop contributing. You know, even if that means volunteering, identifying brands that you love and putting your hand up to say, hey, do you know what? I've got some extra time. Do you want a hand? Keep building out your portfolio whilst you're in a down market. And the beautiful thing about it when you do this is that it tricks the brain to jump out of that sense of scarcity that we feel, you know, when we take a hit like this, if that makes sense. That's great advice. Um, actually, it's funny you should say that about the... Um that side of volunteering, because I saw something on the news last night about that, um, how a lot of people that are in hospitality and have lost their jobs or at the moment have been maybe stood down, they are doing a lot of um, a lot of uh, volunteering work, uh, especially for, for, you know, making food for people that, you know, aren't sort of able to sort of buy their food at the moment because they're on these job seeker uh, payments and they've got rent to pay and, and bills still are coming in and all that sort of thing. And even though some of those things have been relaxed, there's the food side of things. And if you've got children, um, you know, there's a lot of families out there so that are looking for, um, looking, you know, looking for extra um, help, you know, and, and it's wonderful if you can, as you say, if, if you can keep that, brain going and, and continuing through. That's some um, really good advice. Now, tell me a story of something um, you've undertaken in your career that you absolutely love being part of. Oh, this is such a good one. I, um, I think it, for me it would have to be um, just as I started the Talent Connective, I put my hand up to head over to Uganda with the team at The Hunger Project. Um, and this, you know, it was twofold. I, I hadn't done a lot of Africa, had always wanted to head over that way and always had this sense of at some point my career legacy would have something to do with that continent but not knowing really what that was. Um, and the other piece is because a part of our revenue is directed towards those communities, really felt like it's hard to take your customers on a journey that you've not been on or to explain how it's different from other aid groups without going. Um, so yeah, I mean, that trip was so profound for so many reasons. But I remember even just before arriving, you know, I dropped my son off um, with his dad at cricket and then cried the entire trip to the airport, the entire flight to Dubai. And for two hours afterwards, with this sense of what I think Brene Brown calls foreboding joy, you're just like, oh, my God, I've made it. Now I'm going to die. Or <laughs> This is it. This is the end. Uh, so even just to arrive before seeing Africa for me was enough. Um, but I think had this, um, you know, tremendous sense of, you know, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. And um, I, I have never looked back. And I think the lessons from that trip continue to unfold, even though it's been a couple of years now. How long were you away for? Oh, a blink of an eye, probably, I think, two weeks in total. It was very, very quick. Um, but enough to really get under the hood and start to be able to understand and then articulate how does the work differ from conventional aid and what is the impact in the community, what does that look like, and then be able to bring that home and start to gradually digest it, <laughs> if that makes sense. That's wonderful. So, so Emily, why The Hunger Project? Um for me, the Hunger Project is about return on investment, which sounds, um, you know, almost like I've, I've reduced our investment to a stock or a commodity or something in that regard. Um, but when we look at traditional and conventional aid, um, that tends to come in at, at a time of crisis or post-crisis um, when people need help in the immediate. Sometimes what can happen, though, is that communities will build up a dependency on aid um, and are unable to see themselves as um, part of the solution to that. Um, the Hunger Project for the last 
30 odd years has worked with, I think over a million community members across four continents to get people from a point where they can't even fathom three meals a day, you know, or in terms of the level of luxury that that would take through to being completely self-sufficient, to running multiple businesses, to feeding their school, to feeding their children, to running schools. You know, it's a completely different um, mindset and approach that actually is very, very difficult to articulate until you've seen it on the ground, if that makes sense. But for me, it's, it's about that long-term investment of knowing that my money is going to helping generations and communities in the long term to ensure, you know, be you know, the masters of their own future or to free themselves from the chains of severe, severe poverty. It's great you can explain that because um, a lot of people probably have heard of the Hunger Project and set, they've probably seen the T-shirts. I know I have from um, De Cuba, isn't it? De Cuba, the, yes. yeah, the, T, yeah, the THP T-shirts. And uh, that's how I had heard about it, actually. So it's great that you've been able to elaborate on it today. Um, now for some fun questions, a few travel questions. Where is your favourite destination and why? Oh, there's such a good one. I actually, um, my son and I uh, were only just talking about our last trip this morning. We, um, over um, the break, have started to, to foster again. So I had a little girl with us and we all have a little girl with us and we're trying to explain like what if isn't it is overseas and then how do you go there? So we started talking about some of our memories from our last trip through France and Italy and then came back and pulled out our photos and explained the Eiffel Tower and what the south of Italy looks like. So I'm, I'm going to have to go with those. It's fresh to mind. It's beautiful and you can never go to Italy enough. Oh, oh absolutely. I agree. <laughs> I love it too. I love it. Um, who do you think is doing it well in the tourism industry and why? I, uh, I saw a post earlier this week about uh, some of our fabulous tourism companies in the Great Barrier Reef who are unable to take out tours at the moment but are using their dive boats to go out and start to regenerate the Great Barrier Reef. And I thought, what a fabulous service, you know, as a global citizen and, and to local tourism and to the reef itself. I'm very, very impressed. That's great, yeah, and especially at this time where people have got the time to do it. So many things like this are getting done, aren't they? It's like we're almost supposed to have this time. Um, what's your most emotional travel experience? Oh, um, I think there, there are two trips for me that I feel have really changed me on a cellular level. Um, one of those absolutely will be going through Uganda with the Hunger Project and, and that still seems to be unfolding years later. I think the other one actually is about a decade and a half ago, uh, the trip that was the inspiration to start my career through India, Nepal and Thailand. Um, for me, um, I had travelled for years through Europe and the ease of travelling through Europe, uh, I found it very, very confronting to then backpack through India um, for a while and it took me so long to unpack that then and I actually I think the part that um, I'm emotional about is um, I, I, I think I, I'm very disappointed with the way that I responded to things that I would love to go back and change you know things that I hadn't calculated like the travel time on a bus to go from one town to another where the infrastructure isn't there yeah. and you know you just feel yeah. this like level of stress or frustration or and I think now knowing what I know and having been there I'm really ready to go back and I'm like do you know what you could do India so much better than that knowing what you know and just really sink into the flavor of it do it beautifully enjoy it spend time in an ashram calculate that it's going to take you a lot longer to go somewhere it, it, I, you know so I, I think it's this one this niggling trip where you're like do you know what yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. you can probably go back and and do that with a much better mindset that's great and do you think you would like do you think you will over the next couple of years or do you think it will be sooner rather than later or I um I did toy with the idea of heading over um with the Hunger Project. Actually, they were doing a trip this year, which I imagine now is, has been cancelled due to COVID. Um, so will I either do with the Hunger Project or just go and spend some time in an ashram? Either way, it will be amazing. Um, now, if you had the opportunity to have five people join you around your dinner table in lockdown, who would it be? Who would they be? I should say. <laughs> 
I actually, I wrote a little list that I'm a little bit intimidated by. So it's one of those things you like, I would love to invite you for dinner, but I'm so in awe of you, I'm not sure I'd be able to speak. Um, so I had um, or cook, Liz Gilbert. Or cook for that. Or cook for yeah. that. <laughs> I would not attempt to cook. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah I don't know if you if you had a chance to see Liz Gilbert when she spoke in Australia recently no she I was didn't next level yeah. um and had this the room in this kind of like almost ketosis state where people were just you know sitting in their limbic brain for two hours it was amazing for those um, who don't know who she is could you just explain who she is oh absolutely so um she was the author of eat pray love yeah. uh, many many years ago and my inspiration to go to bali also many years ago um i'm sure for a lot of people the same yeah. and it's actually it was interesting because when she spoke she talked about rereading her book and now it's one of those things where it's so obvious that you can travel the world on your own. Yeah. But if we think about 10 years ago and, you know, the level of criticism that you would have received for such a thing or the idea of taking out a year or two of your life, now it's not such a big deal. But mm. I, I think it took some people to pave the way very early on to make that normal. Um, so very grateful to Liz Gilbert for that journey. Um, Tony and Sage Robbins, who I absolutely adore. Oh. Oprah, could anyone not have dinner with Oprah? Um, and the other was Gabby Bernstein. I thought, well, I've got a table of spiritual leaders there. We'll add Gabby to the mix. Sounds, oh, that would be a good one. Actually, I was listening to um, Tony Robbins yesterday on my walk. I often listen to his podcast. So fantastic. So good. And listen, when uh, this all settles down and, uh, and COVID-19 has hopefully gone from our lives, um, where do you think you'll be off to next? So we... We're planning and hopefully if the timing is right, we'll still make it this calendar year. Um, but we're hoping to head to Lapland in Finland in December and head back just before Christmas. Uh, but we'd love to go and take the kids to see Santa and uh, watch the Northern Lights in an igloo and go skiing and then come back for a nice hot Australian Christmas. So Finland is the dream if we can get there with current travel. If not, let's it's next year's dream. Oh, well, that sounds wonderful. Yeah. yeah, and seeing Santa, that'd be great. That'll, you've probably inspired a lot of people now saying that. Um, yeah. Emily, <laughs> Emily, it's really been a, a pleasure to have you on the show and thank you so much. And um, and, and we hope our li listeners will enjoy um, your interview. It sounds, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.